a rented hall in Berlin. The issue wasn't the fact that these church leaders had appeared in buildings adorned with a Nazi party flag. That couldn't be, a, you know, couldn't be avoided if you were going to go to Germany at this time. Instead, the historically noteworthy observation centers on the fact that the church-owned newspaper in Salt Lake City regularly ran wire service stories describing Hitler's treatment of Jews and political dissidents in Germany. But if the prophet or some other important church leader was in the picture, the swastika ceased to be an onerous symbol. Some of this accommodation with the Nazi world view came at a much, with a much more unfortunate price tag. Mission leaders purged German hymnals and lesson plans of any reference to Zion, Israel, or any other wording that could be linked to the Jewish faith. In one, so there was no more ye elders of Israel, or Israel, Israel, God is calling. The choir, those pages came out of hymnals. In one instance, a freshly painted instructional man, excuse me, a freshly printed instructional manual was noted to have an inadvertent reference to Judaism. The mission president issued orders for the offending page to be cut out and the two facing pages to be glued together. Much more disturbingly, in some Mormon branches, converts from Judaism were shot. One branch president, a Mormon lay minister in a small congregation, put a sign in front of his meeting house, Jews are not allowed here. This was Arthur Zander, Helmut Huberner's ecclesiastical leader, whom we will talk about later. Zander once ordered that pictures of Jesus Christ and Joseph Smith be removed from the walls of his St. Georg meeting house near Hamburg and be replaced by a portrait of Adolf Hitler. He would modify the Sunday meeting schedule to incorporate the Fuhrer's radio speeches and then lock the meeting house doors so that members of the branch could not leave. He incorporated the Horst Vessel song, the Nazi party, Nazi party anthem, into choral practice. Then he sent children around as spies, roaming around the room to report on whether the adults were singing the Nazi songs as fervently as they sang church hymns. The wife of one American mission president rode in Hitler's limousine with the Nazi woman's leader and the Fuhrer himself on the way to youth, Hitler youth encampments. This is a hell of a story. Uh, Elizabeth Welke forged a special relationship with Gertrude Schultz Klink, the Nazi, the National Socialist Reichsfrauenführer, which eventually led to Welker's meetings with Hitler's. Here's how this came about. In the, af in the aftermath of the 1936 party rally at Nuremberg, a scandal was brewing under the surface in Nazi Germany. 100,000 German youth, including Mormon adolescents, attended that rally. Some 900 German girls, aged 15 to 19, returned home pregnant. Paternity could not be established in 400 cases, which probably indicated that some young women had had multiple sexual partners. Elizabeth Welker, who was in charge of all young women's activities in the German-Austrian mission, was concerned for the welfare of Mormon young women who regularly participated in the Bund Deutsche Mädel, the League of German Girls. She wrote Schultz Klink to inquire about moral standards in BDM camps. A relationship developed between the two women, which resulted in Welker writing a glowing account of the attributes of German adolescent females in an issue of the Improvement Era, along with homey admonitions for American youth to follow the example of German teenagers, for example, to wear modest clothing and eat sensible food, and not let their underwear show. <laughs> there was also there was also disquieting passages in this passages in this Improvement Era article. One paragraph commented on the dating habits of German girls, noting that when a potential suitor came to visit, he'd find her pedigree chart hanging on the wall. This was to assure him that she would be a strong candidate mar for marriage so that they could build, in her words, a strong race. By 1937, Roy Anson Welcome, Lizzie's husband, 
had recently returned from three years as president of the Berlin-based German-Austrian mission. He told the Salt Lake Tribune, Jews are safer in Germany today than in many parts of the world. If Welker had uttered those words in 1935, after the passage of the Nuremberg race laws, he might have been excused for embracing a common misconception. Many Germans believed the violence against Jews would stop. Although they had lost their German citizenship, they were now subjects of the German Empire. Some Germans thought Jews would become protected citizens. By 1937, such an utterance was absurd. Welker also believed that Hitler showed favoritism to the Mormons and that the Nazis had based their monthly one-pot charitable meal custom on the LDS practice of Fast Sunday. It was a belief shared by many German Mormons. Other varieties of that myth held that, German, that Hitler had been saved on the World War I battlefield by a church member, that Hitler had read the Book of Mormon, that Hitler was even a secret Mormon. But Walker persisted in believing these myths for the rest of his adult life. Another American mission president was quite a bit more sophisticated little passage from chapter 10 of my book. Copenhagen's regal pa uh, palace hotel, glimmering in its recently remodeled splendor, hosted a brash newcomer at the annual meeting of the European mission presidents in May 1938. Among the 11 middle-aged men who attended with their wives, the most popular discussion topic concerned an energetic, aggressive former businessman and political activist from from Salt Lake City, who had won his position in the Berlin-based East German Mission Presidency in a power struggle with a rival mission leader. Before the conference began, before the conference began, Alfred C. Rees had intrigued but mystified his colleagues with a cryptic memorandum that claimed that he had extracted, quote, some important unprecedented concessions from the German government, unquote actions he couldn't mention specifically in writing, but would be discussed in the meeting. Franklin J. Murdoch, the president of the Netherlands mission in 1938, recalled that a number of his contemporaries expressed discomfort with reports of close collaboration between Rees and the government of the Third Reich. Some, mindful of the way the Nazis were regarded around the world, believed that and unsavory, that such an unsavory association would sully the church's reputation. Others, thinking pragmatically, maintained that Hitler's government could not be trusted to live up to any bargain it struck with the Mormons. Rees appealed for his colleagues' patience and trust. Murdoch, however, employed his own method for assessing Rees' devotion to Adolf Hitler. One morning, while the mission presidents were descending a long, ornate staircase, in the Palace Hotel's lobby, Murdoch silently positioned himself behind the German mission leader. Murdoch recounted, quote, he didn't see me. I put my hand on his right shoulder quickly, and I said, Hell Hitler. Murdoch described Rees' sudden startled reaction, quote, he swung around and said, Heil Hitler, showing that he was used to that and that he would go along with that. I did it just jokingly, to scare him, you see. But after he recovered, he said, quote, oh, you'd better be careful. I have a weak heart. But I wanted to test him out to see if you could get him unsolicited and unbeknownst to him. How quickly he responded, Heil Hitler. Of course, that wasn't thing, the thing for an American to do unless you were in favor of the regime. Reese's colleagues had reason to suspect him of an unprecedented, unprecedented degree of collaboration with the Nazis. His reputation had preceded him. During 23 months as a mission president in Germany, Alfred C. Rees did more to affiliate the Mormon church with the National Socialist than any predecessor. He had met with, import he met with important business leaders and state officials. He forged an agreement with Joseph Goebbels' propaganda ministry to purge daily newspapers of anti-Mormon articles and arranged for his missionaries to publish positive accounts of the LDS Church in municipal newspapers around Germany. When the most important Nazi party daily subsequently printed an article about the Mormons that Rees did not like, 
he arranged for the Furkashi Probachter, the People's Observer, to publish an article that he had written that drew numerous parallels between Mormonism and Nazism and between Utah and Germany. In the weeks before the outbreak of the Second World War, Rees' savvy media relations skills promoted a uh, prompted a Nazi-controlled radio station to broadcast a shortwave program on Mormon topics intended for a Utah audience. Yes, this was a radio station in Nazi Germany preaching the gospel to Utah. His excellent command of the German language allowed him to cultivate business and government contacts that a speaker with less fluency could not have accomplished. In the autumn of 1937, Rees and his wife traveled to the, anti, to the annual Nazi party rally in Nuremberg, where they enjoyed torchlight parades, fireworks displays, and other spectacular swastika-themed pageantry in the company of the local Mormon missionaries. When Italian fascist dictator Benito Mussolini visited Berlin, Rees posed as a correspondent for the, New York, for the Los Angeles Times in order to receive a prominent viewing pass based upon his response to his colleague's surprise prank in the Danish hotel. Rees presumably rendered the Heil Hitler greeting with shameless regularity. Mormons willingly served in the National Labor Corps in the, and in the German Army. They enlisted as brown-shirted stormtroopers and black-shirted SS, in much the same proportion as Catholic and Protestant Germans. Mormon Mormon children were as enthusiastic about the Hitler Youth and the League of German Girls as other boys and girls. One Latter-day Saint maintained specialized equipment in Auschwitz. That's a euphemism for a gas chamber and crematorium mechanic. Another Mormon baptized in 1923 joined the brown-shirted S.A five years later in 1928. He ran a wild concentration camp in a converted Berlin, Berlin police station. He tortured and killed Hitler's political opponents, mostly communist and social democrats. He presided over a chamber of horrors. He beat prisoners with a rubber, with a rubber trenching and sliced open the soles of their feet, packing pepper into the wounds. He, ex he exercised prisoners to the point of exhaustion then gave them a concoction of urine and feces to drink. Then, as a military policeman during the war, he was on duty at the scene of liquidated Jewish ghettos in Poland. When he faced post-war trial, the American mission president, Walter Stover, paid his pre-trial bail. Inability to produce a living eyewitness to the murders and expiration of the statute of limitations on his non-lethal crimes <laughs> meant that Eric Krause never faced justice. He died as a full-fledged honored member of the church in 1981, having enjoyed callings as a state genealogy leader and as a high councilman. I wrote this book to give my readers a historically accurate version of how the Mormon experience in Nazi Germany transpired, and more importantly, how today's Mormons choose to remember their past. When the, Second World, when the Second World War ended, the battle of memory began. After World War II, more than 4,000 Germans came to the American Zion. They wanted to build new lives and to forget certain aspects of their old lives, but the innocent past has a way of resurfacing. The inconvenient past, excuse me. The inconvenient past has a way of resurfacing. <clears throat> In, 19, in the 1970s, their desire to dim an undesirable memory beacon ran headlong into a conflict with a couple of, with a, excuse me, with a trio of BYU professors, a German linguist, a historian, and a playwright, who wished to brighten the memory beacon of a young man named Helmut Hubener. Hubener is the quintessential Mormon memory beacon. He comes equipped with a dimmer switch that LDS authors and church leaders can use to ratchet up or dial down his memory according to the perceived needs of the church. For those of you who may not have heard of Hubener, for those few who probably haven't, 
I will provide you the one minute Huebner. <laughs> Helmuth Huebner was a 16 year old Mormon boy in Hamburg when he began listening to the forbidden wartime broadcast of the BBC. He wrote anti-Nazi tracts on a church typewriter and his two Mormon teenage cohorts scattered them around Hamburg's neighborhoods. He was betrayed by a colleague at work. He and his adolescent cohorts suffered interrogation and torture at Gestapo headquarters. Then, after a kangaroo court before red robed Nazi justices, he died on a 19th century guillotine. Ten days after Huebner's capture, his Nazi sympathizing Mormon branch president excommunicated him. Unfortunately for most of the faithful, that is the extent of Mormon history in Nazi Germany. They know nothing about the post war uh, mechanizations over, over Huebner's memory. The resulting on-campus play in 1976 drew long serpentine lines, as generally happens only when tickets are sold for football, basketball, or rock concerts. The student actors in Thomas Rogers' play, Huebner, received campus recognition comparable to star athletes. They looked forward to taking the, pay, taking the play on the road to California, where wealthy BYU alumni had offered to sponsor the production. But the Mormon hierarchy shut down subsequent performance of Tom Rogers' play and delayed publication of, research, of related research by Alan Keel and Douglas Tobler. Recent German immigrants to Utah, some of whom had been members of the SA and the SS, were uncomfortable with the limelight being, fo being focused on a young man that they still considered to be a traitor. They also wished to darken the historical spotlight on their own past. The LDS leadership was afraid that the Mormon youth in communist East Germany, where a, sub, where a substantial number of believers remained, might rebel against the government, much to the chagrin of the BYU professors, who maintained that the East German government would never confuse an anti-fascist with an anti-communist. Even when Huebner's co-conspirators wrote their own books, faithful publishers consulted Mormon general authorities for guidance. One book, Ghost Written for Huebner co-conspirator Rudy Voba, did not mention Huebner's excommunication in two separate editions published 10 years apart. As late as the first decade of the 21st century, a senior Mormon apostle, Boyd K. Packer, was allowed to review and then to rename a BYU-funded film about Helmut Huebner. The church leadership is not the only body that attempts to exercise control over the collective memory of the Mormonism in Nazi Germany. Individuals and families also brighten and darken those beacons of memory. In 1995, 19 years after Dallin Oaks and Thomas S. Monson put a stop to Huebner-related scholarly publication by BYU faculty, Alan Keel and Blair Holmes published a scholarly monograph on the subject. But a decade after that, Richard Lloyd Dewey brought up, bought up all the unsold copies of the University of Illinois Press's stock of the book. Dewey, who had once written a faith-promoting biography of Mormon gunslinger Porter Rockwell, had published his own version of Huebner's life. More than half a century after Huebner died on the Nazi guillotine, the shenanigans of memory regarding his life had still not abated. Do you know that the Mormons had their own version of Oscar Schindler? In the case of Max Reschke, his family has controlled the dimmer switch that limits the commemoration of his heroism. Max Reschke was a Hanover industrial shop manager and a Mormon branch president. He saved two Jews from almost certain death. He unsuccessfully tried to hide another Jewish man in his house and sent his child with nourishment to that man's wife in the Hanover ghetto. As a German citizen in wartime, he displayed uncharacteristically charitable behavior toward enemy prisoners. He went out of his way to preserve the lives of a Polish slave laborer and a Russian prisoner of war. 
Max Reschke was a stubborn man. He opposed the pseudo-unionization of his shop workers by the Nazi labor front. He protested the absorption of the LDS Boy Scout troop by the Hitler Youth. When a brown-shirted youngster arrived at his house seeking to conscript one of his young sons, Max threw the kid out by the seat of his trousers and the scuff of his neck. When a Nazi peddler tried to sell him a tin swastika badge to fund the 1935 Nuremberg rally, Max loudly rebuked him, saying he wasn't a party member and wouldn't pay a penny. When Hitler conducted a plebiscide to ratify the remilitarization of the Rhineland in 1936, the Fuhrer received 99% of the vote, or so the government announced. Max Reschke conspicuously voted no, and like he often did, he attracted the attention of the Gestapo. According to his son, the secret police was so familiar with this rebellious industrialist that he didn't have to go through the normal booking process when brought into the station house. They had his information on file already. His secretary at work devised a code to let the family know that he was once again in trouble with the law. Quote, Max is out of town, she would tell Max's wife. An ordinary citizen would not have survived such a rebellious streak in Nazi Germany, but like Oskar Schindler, Max had powerful friends in local industry that would intervene on his behalf and get him out of jail. On Crystal, on the night of November 9th and 10th, 1938, Max displayed his greatest bravery and took his biggest risk. He witnessed the horrors of Kristallnacht, that nationwide Nazi-directed Nazi pogrom that saw Jewish shops vandalized, synagogues burned, and thousands of Jews either killed or shipped to camps. Max recognized a familiar Jewish couple in the company of a brown-shirted thug. Impersonating a plainclothes policeman, he flipped his locale quickly, flashing a non-existent police badge. He told the guard, I'll take these two, and somehow succeeded in the subterfuge. Then he embarked on a 400-mile cross-country odyssey, giving the uh, driving the couple throughout the night and the next morning, eventually crossing the Swiss border and delivering them to safety. Why do Max's heroics remain almost unknown? Why is there a filter of memory on what would otherwise be a very logical hero for Mormon and Mormon hierarchy and Mormon establishment to promote? Historians Douglas Tobler and D. Michael Quinn revealed his exploits almost 20 years ago, although buried deep in, Tobler's scholarly, in, a, in one of Tobler's scholarly articles and in an appendix to Quinn's book. Mormons seem fascinated with Helmut Huberman, whose pure oil rebellion saved no one but cost him his own life. It would seem that Max Reschke would be a natural recipient of Mormon adulation, but he remains relatively unknown today, and that's on purpose. Before Max's son Horace died a few years ago, he told me that the family's simple modesty discouraged them from seeking recognition from their father. That could be, but I have two other suggestions. First, like Huebner, Max Reschke did not adhere to the Mormon survival strategy in Germany under the Third Reich. Max refused to go along and get along with a totalitarian government.